We're going on a journey into the darkest chasms and caverns of the mind, deep down into the unconscious. We find a shadowy labyrinth with innumerable winding gates and alleys. At the center of the maze, we find a door, ancient and ornately carved with symbols and hieroglyphs from the earliest dawn of man. Do you dare? Perhaps you'd better not. Don't open the door. The tale that I'm about to unfold for you occurred when I was a boy, living on the west side of Buffalo, New York. Before I begin, I must emphasize that the days of my youth are remembered as a stint in the southern climes of hell. The reasons for this were multiple. Let me start with the obvious. I was born with a birthmark on my right cheek, bright, fiery, and red, as the devil himself had laid his palm upon my face while in the womb. In truth, it didn't really bother me so much internally. I just wasn't made to concern myself so much with superficial appearances. But you could imagine the sophistication of the other children in understanding the simple biological reason. On top of this, my personality was on the side of extreme introversion, and therefore I had tendencies to remain socially withdrawn, aloof to the concerns and consternations of my peers. Rather than facing the external world which had revealed itself from the earliest moments of my birth to be a cruel and chaotic master, mine was an inner world of rich imagination. In fact, once I had formulated in my mind a fixed idea I could sit for days in isolation, slowly turning it around and examining it from every possible angle. But somehow, this inclination for deep and sophisticated bouts of thought didn't translate well to my performance in school. Given the circumstances of my upbringing, perhaps that's to be expected. In time, I hope you'll come to understand someone like me. Why I did what I did, where I am now, and so forth. And through this understanding, perhaps something will occur that only a true understanding can give birth to. That is, you will come to love me. And for the first time, I will be loved, truly, wholly, Eternally. I was 12 years of age when this all began, and I had just entered into the sixth grade. It was early October still, and my artistic constitution was thrilled with the multifarious browns and oranges of the fall. Through the month of October, I remember always carrying with me an impression of the mysteriousness of the world around me. The coming of Halloween at the end of the month would be a culmination of this mysterious feeling whereby dark and thrilling apparitions were loosed into the otherwise mundane world only for the space of an evening. It was on one of those days in the early weeks of October that I first saw the straw man. That day at school was the same as the hundreds of previous days over the years. Like I said before, every day was hell on earth. I remember sitting in math class. I always sat in the back despite the fact that the teachers assigned the seats. This pattern seemed almost constant, as if they wanted to hide me away in a dark corner. I was staring out the window, watching the complex swirl of the multicolored fallen leaves while daydreaming, as usual, letting the scenes from my favorite book, The Hobbit, unfold in my mind under various different lights. I suddenly felt my desk jump to the side a bit as a student across from me kicked the back leg of my seat. 
I didn't let this disrupt me though. As such, unexpected and undeserved assaults were commonplace throughout my entire life up to that point. Instead, I continued to imagine and evaluate the journeys of the wise wizard Gandalf, the timid Bilbo Baggins, and the sly and slithering Gollum. But these transports, while bulwark and strongly defensible, were not unassailable. When a chalk eraser sailed past my head, missing my ear by only the margin of an inch, I came to, painfully back to the world my body inhabited. Welcome back, the teacher invited. Once again, you find the lesson to be beneath you, I see. I didn't look up at the teacher, Miss Crawford, but merely stared down at my desk. As I heard a few of the boys snickering, my face began to turn bright red. Now, I know they've been passing you along up to this point in spite of your failures in mathematics, but that won't be the case with me. You'll spend the rest of your life up to old age in the sixth grade if you don't wise up your act, and I won't be here to change your vile bedpan. You'll sit in your own filth. The class erupted now in laughter. I couldn't help but glance up at Miss Crawford, who stood at the front of the class, hands on her hips with a self-satisfied smile. As I stared at her, I felt a strange, tingling sensation in my spine, and even against my will, by degrees, I developed a painful, uncontrollable, rock-hard erection as I stared at her curving figure and jutting cleavage, and heretofore, unthinkable ideas began to pass through my being combined with the shame and humiliation I felt. What happened next was enough to break anyone. I heard her address me again. Well... I asked you to come up to the board and solve the problem for the rest of the class. That means now. I'm waiting and you're testing my patience. I can't, I whispered just loud enough for her to hear my claim. You can't. Why the hell can't you? Everyone in the class participates. Do we need to have you evaluated for the special classes? No, I whispered again as the snickering continued from all sides. Then you'd better do as I say, lickety split. My mind was racing, my heart pounding out of my chest. In the moment, I couldn't figure a way out of it, and I simply complied. I stood slowly, placing my hands in a ball in front of my groin as I began walking down the aisle of the desk in a hunched-over fashion, but I didn't get far. What are you doing? Stop right there, she commanded in a loud, most serious voice. What have you got in your hands? Is it a weapon? Raise your hands now, or I'll have you expelled. I felt as if I stood before a firing squad as I slowly stood up and did as I was told. Why, you filthy... Dirty little, she was cut off by one of the boys named Richard Peck, the same one who had kicked my desk, the same boy who had been one of my tormentors since my earliest days in school. I'll never forget his shouted words. He's got a boner, he exclaimed as the class erupted with heretofore unthinkable levels of laughter and excitement. You disgusting little worm. Miss Crawford shouted over the rabble. Go to the principal's office now. I'll not have you disrupting my class with your dirty habits. I'm calling the office now. I watched as she crossed the room and picked up the phone. Now get out of my sight. I slowly walked out of the class, hunched over with head hung low. I felt as if I were the shrinking man like Alice when she drank that potion to pass through the keyhole. 
As I slowly walked down the hall, I remembered desperately attempting the return to Middle Earth, to just forget the world that I inhabited. This was in vain as the feelings of shame and self-hatred swirled through my body, making it tingle all over as if it were attempting to will itself out of existence. As I drew closer to the principal's office, voices from within audibly were heard down the quiet hall. When I was within earshot, I heard one of the secretaries saying, He's on his way. The one with a face only a mother could love. Gotcha. That says it all. I heard the principal's voice chime in before the sound of a door shutting. I stopped in my tracks, my chest painfully contracting with emotion. After a few minutes, during which even thought couldn't penetrate the vacant, swirling vacuum of my mind, I continued forward and entered the office. The secretary gave me a disgusted look, a knowing look, and merely stated, Sit down in one of those chairs and wait till Mr. Eden calls you in. She then proceeded to ignore me for the duration of my stay there, as if I were completely invisible. I sat for what seemed an eternity during which the anxiety, the shame, and the dread couldn't be banished from my breast. I tried to imagine that I was merely waiting for Gandalf the Great to walk in and compel me onto a perilous journey, but I knew this was not to be. As the door to the principal's office finally opened, the tall, gray Mr. Eden, who wore a complimentary gray suit, and who wore his glasses at the end of his nose, looked down at me with an uninterested glare. Come on in, young man. I walked in and sat down in the chair across from his desk, trembling. How are we doing today? He stared at his computer monitor, clicking away as he spoke, as if eye contact with me were beneath him. Fine, I whispered. What's that, young man? Speak up. He glared at me with a slight menace from above the horn rims of those glasses. I cleared my throat and spoke up aloud. Fine, sir, he quickly retorted. If everything was fine, I don't think you'd be sitting here in my office. I heard you made quite a disruption in Miss Crawford's class. Quite a display. No, sir. No? He questioned as he glared at me again. Don't lie to me, boy. Or are you saying Miss Crawford has lied to me in this case? Sorry, sir. It was me. It was you, then. Yes, sir. Now, the nature of the disruption you caused, it's disturbing to me in its nature. He swiveled in his chair and now lowered his eyes to me. Miss Crawford is a fine lady, don't you think? I don't know, sir. Your actions betray you, young man. I've been told you took a run at her with a bulge in the front of your pants. No, sir, no, I couldn't, I didn't. Now, boy, this is the fourth time this year we've attempted to get a hold of your mother to discuss your disruptive antics and gotten no response. Now, why is that? I don't know, sir. My voice trembled. He pressed his lips together as if in disapproval. Given your mother's profession, I'm not surprised by your proclivities. Now, due to the fact that we can't get a hold of her, I'm going to let this one go. But if anything like this happens again, you'll be out of here, expelled. And that young man is what we call hashtag me too. Now get out of my sight and learn some common decency. 
Rather than go back to class, I went to the bathroom and spent the rest of the day hiding in a stall. I kept thinking of Miss Crawford. The shame I felt under the lashes of her tongue, intertwined with the jiggling vision of her cleavage, which was burnt into my mind like a video on repeat. The erection returned, and I slowly rubbed at it with the palm of my hand. To be clear, at this point in my development through puberty, I hadn't ejaculated. However, these strange urges which welled up from some place I knew not had of late begun to overwhelm me. When finally, a teacher came in calling my name, I came out telling them I felt sick and had thrown up. They took me to the nurse where I laid in a bed behind a curtain for the remainder of the school periods. When it was time to go home, I waited till well after the final bell rang, in hopes that the halls would be empty by that time, and I made my way to my locker. I didn't live far from the school, so I walked, and didn't have to worry about catching a bus. When I was finally forced out by the nurse, I imagined my plan had worked. The halls were all quiet, and even a church mouse would have been heard snickering down the hall. As I gathered my backpack from my locker, a new form of dread began to well within me. The walk home was one which had always been perilous. After that, journey through purgatory, I would be faced with going home for the rest of the night, the most dreadful part of it all, even more so than the literal hell I experienced daily at school. Outside the skies were gray, threatening a storm. I surveyed the lay of the land to make sure that the coast was clear. As far as I could tell, the vast majority of students had been picked up by their parents had vacated via the buses, or had already started the walk home, and so I began my own fearful sojourn into the deep. I walked the same route every day, which was certainly not the shortest path as the bird flies, but for one such as I, it appeared to be the safest. Even saying that, there was still some compromise here, Dangers of a certain nature that I had carefully considered and accepted in exchange for avoiding others, much more terrifying to my youthful mind. As I passed this main thoroughfare where danger lurked, the public basketball courts, the illusion of safety quickly left my heart. There, dribbling upon the courts, was the avatar of my tormented youth, Richard Peck and his gang of lackeys. The worst of it was that they had seen me before I had even noticed them. They stood staring at me talking among themselves as I walked past the chain link fence, doing my best to only observe them from the corner of my eye, as if I hadn't noticed their presence in the park. I knew that I wouldn't come out of this unscathed, and so as soon as I saw movement from the corner of my eye, I knew that the entire gang had simultaneously burst into a sprint in my direction, and I began to run as fast as I could. Peck was a year older than me, which gave him quite an edge, and most of his gang was athletic. I didn't stand a chance of escaping the confrontation outright, and I knew it. I ran past numerous blocks of houses, past restaurant patrons sitting on patios and past mechanics spraying down the parking lots. Not one person seemed to be interested in rendering aid to the younger boy who was being chased by five. Just as I turned onto the block where my house was, I felt myself being thrown from my feet after a rubbery object pelted me in the back. As I lay on the cement, I watched the basketball bounce on the road, and as I stood, one of the lackeys sped past me after the ball. As I stood with a bloody chin, 
and continued to run. I heard Peck's voice right behind me. Your mother's a whore. She screwed the devil. That's why your face has the devil's mark. The first stone hit my backpack and fell to the ground behind me harmlessly. But I knew it wouldn't be the last. I heard their footsteps hot on the pavement behind me and I felt a sharp pain in the back of my head as hot blood began to ooze through my hair. Whore's son, they chanted. Devil's brood. I was pelted in the ass, in the arm, and in the back of the neck with more stones. As I tore down the sidewalk, tears flowed freely from my eyes, and I screamed at the top of my lungs as astonished men mowing their grass watched me fleeing my attackers without moving. As I finally reached the house we rented and tore up the sidewalk onto the porch, I saw something which terrified me deep down to my soul and caused me to trip on the stairs, collapsing onto the porch. There, sitting on the porch in a folding lawn chair, was a man. He wore jeans and a checkered flannel shirt, worn work boots and work gloves. On his face he wore a mask, one that portrayed demonic eyes and devil's horns. On his lower face, covering his mouth, was another mask layered on top of the first that covered his mouth. It was like to the bite guard or muzzle worn by Dr. Lecter in Silence of the Lambs. As I stared up at the figure, I trembled. I heard the footsteps coming hard up the sidewalk and I instinctually threw myself into the lap of this figure without thinking. I braced for the impact that I would momentarily feel. However, in time, it didn't come. The footsteps had ceased and were no longer pursuing me. I heard a diminished sounding voice say, let's just get out of here. Leave the freak till tomorrow. We'll give him payback at school. It was Peck speaking and with that, the footsteps retreated precipitously. I realized that the figure I now embraced collapsed under my weight and gave way to an itchy softness. It was a straw man. I sat in wonder for a moment that my mother had bothered to concoct such a scarecrow, having never been into Halloween decorations in the past. But this was soon the furthest thing from my mind as I clutched my aching skull and felt blood ooze between my fingers. I collapsed again, face down into the straw man's lap and continued to sob uncontrollably. As the rage filled within me, I began to wail at length. I wish they were all just dead. I wish they were dead. I want them all dead. As I repeated these oaths, I felt a strong wind pick up. The arm of the straw man slumped over my back. I immediately recoiled, falling onto my ass and scuttling away from the figure. But as I observed it, all was as it should be. A mere spell of sudden wind had caught the arm of the straw man and forced it off the rail of the chair, I reasoned. I got the courage to stand up and walk closer to the figure, bending down cautiously to examine its garments and mask. There were some brownish, rusty-looking stains on the jeans and on the flanks of the shirt. I wondered where my mother had found this stuff. As for the mask, it looked high-end, detailed and expensive, creating more wonder in my youthful mind. Something about the straw man sent a chill through me as I examined him, forcing me to turn, gather my backpack up, and head inside quickly. Inside, the house was the usual dark and soiled mess. 
I kicked off my sneakers in the foyer, threw my backpack in the corner, and headed into the kitchen. I stood with the fridge open, staring at the desolate shelves that in my mind's eye were full of cobwebs. There was an almost empty package of Oscar Mayer bologna and a few slices of Wonder Bread left. I grabbed these items along with a bottle of mustard, which was the only condiment in the fridge. As I slapped the sandwich together, a yellow watery substance shot out of the mustard bottle, and I sighed as I slapped the bread on top of it to soak it up. I sat down at the kitchen table to eat, which was my wont, despite the fact that I had been asked by my mother on numerous occasions why I didn't eat in the living room, in front of the television, like she did. In many ways, I didn't take after her, purposely so. As I began to eat the sandwich, I heard someone coming rapidly down the stairs. I watched as a Hispanic man stood in the foyer, pulling his boots on. He took a sidewise glance into the kitchen before doing a double take. As he looked at me, he seemed somewhat unnerved. I scrunched up my face and stuck out my tongue with a chewed up ball of bread and meat on it. The man smiled, shaking his head and muttering something to himself as he went out the door, making sure to keep a wide berth from the straw man on the porch, I noticed. Not much later, another pair of footsteps was coming down the stairs, this time slower and softer. I saw my mother land in the foyer and look out the window of the door quickly before turning down the hall and heading towards my location in the kitchen. She was completely nude. That was how she always was. I'd rarely seen her wear clothing, let alone underwear in the house, unless the furnace was on the fritz during cold winter months. As she entered the kitchen, one could see her large breasts and hips swaying with her movements. I watched as she moved to the refrigerator and began making herself a sandwich with that last bit of meat and bread. I see you started dinner without me, she said casually as she slapped the meat and bread together. Not much of a dinner, I said somewhat sourly. She crossed the room with her sandwich in hand and pulled the chair across from me out, sitting down in it, before placing her bare feet up on the table. The odor of blood hit me in the face like a sledgehammer, and I saw a small string hanging out from her vagina. I set the sandwich down and must have been grimacing, for she uttered with her mouth full of food. I'm on my period. Give me a break, you little bastard. I'm just not hungry today, I answered. She continued to speak in between bites of her sandwich. I just got paid pretty good, sweetie. The fridge will be full by tomorrow night. Don't you worry. Of course I didn't know if I could bank on this statement. I stared at her left arm, which was currently reaching out towards her foot, where her fingers played with her toes, and counted the fresh track marks on it. As she finished devouring her sandwich, she put her feet down and leaned forward, really looking at me for the first time. Her face dropped suddenly as she reached across the table, grabbing my chin. Oh, darling. What the hell happened to your face? Was it those little assholes again? I shook my head from side to side, pulling my chin out of her hand. I tripped, that's all. She shook her head slowly now. I swear, boy, you get clumsier every day. You can't put one foot in front of the other. Definitely your father's son. I put my head down and stared at my knees. I only dimly remembered the man who had left us about six years ago. She had always told me that it was my fault he had left, that he hadn't wanted me. 
Anyways, she spoke lazily as she leaned back, cupping her breasts in her hands and massaging them. You'll have to stay home from school the rest of the week. Can't have that pesky school poking around, asking questions about your scrapes. You want to wind up in a state home or the foster system? That's like a prison, my son. I shook my head, indicating that I didn't want to. That's my good boy. I'll write you up one of my famous doctor's notes for when you go back next week. She stood and crossed to my side of the table, throwing her arms around my neck and forcing my face up. That's a handsome boy. Such a pretty boy. No, I'm not, I said fiercely, trying to push her away, but to no avail. She grabbed my chin again and forced me to look at her. Don't you say that. Don't you ever say that. Why? Because of his stupid birthmark? Trust me, you're a pretty looking boy. When you get older, those girls won't care about that. And some of them will prefer it. Just how some of us girls are into guys with scars. No difference. You got your looks from your mother. Your father was uglier than sin. Thank God he left. I changed the subject quickly. Why'd you make that straw man, Ma? Where'd you get the clothes? She backed up now and leaned against the kitchen counter. As she did, she threw her head back and chuckled. I didn't make it. You think I'd make something like that? I looked at her gravely now. What do you mean? How did it get there then? Must have been my customer playing a joke. The guy who stayed over last night? I leaned forward in my chair. You mean the guy just left out of here? She laughed again. No, Sonny. A different guy was here last night. Left before I woke up. Must have made it last night. But where did the clothes come from? The guy left without his clothes? She now approached me, dancingly, mockingly, letting her nakedness jiggle in front of my eyes before flashing her rear end at me. Oh yes, your mother made a streaker out of him. No, silly. Those were your daddy's clothes. He must have gone down to the basement and found them in the box. He was just playing a joke. But what about the mask? It looks... I don't know. Are, are you going to get rid of him? Do you want me to get rid of him? I kind of like him. He's strong and sexy. It's nice to have a Halloween decoration. A real man to guard the house for once. Makes me feel kind of festive too. And scares away those damn neighborhood kids. Soon after, she left the kitchen. And I didn't see her again for the remainder of the night. I nibbled away at the rest of my sandwich as the events of the day replayed in my mind over and over again, like the grand narrative of a Tolkien novel, where I, the chosen one, the unassuming and hapless hero of the story, was assailed on all sides. As I went up to my bedroom and sat in the quiet darkness for hours, the burning hatred for Richard Peck and the strange feelings for Miss Crawford consumed me. The erection recurred as I began to imagine Miss Crawford without her clothes on. However, I didn't know just what to do about it. As I gradually slipped away into sleep, the same dream recurred to me, which was one of the only memories I had of being with my father. He had woken me in the middle of the night and had me get dressed. I must have been only six years old. Outside it was snowing and pitch dark. Even the street lights were all off. And he held my hand as he guided me down the street. We entered into a bar down the street and there were many people inside holding candles. It seemed as if the power was out. In my young, tired mind, I couldn't comprehend what was going on and lacked the proper speech to ask my father. All I knew was the people were whispering in low voices. 
and their faces were somber and grave. There were a few women with tears in their eyes. I noticed a jar was being passed around and each individual was reaching into their pockets or handbags and adding a few dollar bills or handfuls of change into the jar. Without warning, it suddenly grew very cold as if someone had left a door somewhere within the establishment open to the night. When a strange rustling noise suddenly broke out, everyone quickly made their way towards the door we had entered into and went out in a hurry, into the street, into the darkness, where even a hand in front of one's face was invisible. My father guided me as the people moved as a crowd through the street. We occasionally bumped into an unseen person and had to adjust our course. Eventually, the group entered into another establishment, whereby the same pattern of events seemed to occur. This continued several more times before my memory of the night faded, which is how my dream always ends. After that, my dreams veered towards the straw man on the porch. I dreamed that he had risen and come into my bedroom. He stood at the foot of my bed staring at me for some time before leaving my room. I heard the door closing as he went out into the night. The next few days at home went by without incident. I saw little of my mother which wasn't unusual for the days following one of her big payouts. She had bought at least one bag of groceries and had left me $20 on the counter before she disappeared, carousing on the town, and I was pretty much left to take care of myself. This was fine by me. I was able to enjoy the quietude and found solace in reading my books, getting lost once again in the land of Middle Earth, the Sire, and Mount Doom. Meanwhile, the acute levels of rage and hatred that had been boiling within my being had softened as my chin and scalp had scabbed up and the pain had faded almost to nothing. All the while, I occasionally went out on the porch and sat next to the straw man, either reading my book or simply watching people pass by. I enjoyed watching their subtle reactions to the straw man of shock, of fear, and most satisfyingly, of awe. In brief, I felt powerful, maybe for the first time in my life as I sat next to the scarecrow. The following week on my walk to school, I noticed that conspicuously, the basketball court and the park were generally empty. On a typical day, I'd watch high school delinquents playing ball well beyond the first bell as I passed the courts. The streets, in general, seemed emptier than usual for a school day, and I didn't pass any other kids walking to school that day. I didn't learn the reasons for this until I got to school and sat down in my homeroom class, which just so happened to be math with Miss Crawford. The tone in the classroom was somber, and Miss Crawford's eyes were red as if she'd been recently crying. As I turned, I noticed the desk next to mine was empty. Miss Crawford made an announcement that day. While Richard Peck had gone missing the week previously, his body had been found over the weekend. While Miss Crawford didn't provide any further details during the announcement, I would gather later that day from the rumor mill that he had been savagely beaten to death. His head had been caved in and was unrecognizable. There were also rumors passed down from the older kids that the crime was sexually motivated. His parents had to identify the body through verification of birthmarks and known scars. I felt as if I'd gone into some kind of strange trance as I watched Miss Crawford veritably weep in front of the class. I was again feeling that insatiable arousal, even as my heart ached for the woman who stood in front of the class. 
we were dismissed from class to go sit in the gymnasium where counselors were milling about, talking to the kids who felt they needed it. I sat in one of the corners, far from everyone else, either reading one of my books or just observing the others. I was conflicted. I saw my peers collectively giving off signals of grief to one another. But I was perplexed as to how these signals could have arose from a genuine and sanctified emotion. No one at this age really knew anyone else that deeply. And this guy had been at Creighton. I, for one, knew that I'd be able to walk home in relative peace, at least for a while. Though I perhaps bore the brunt of his insults, I knew that there were others who had suffered under his onslaughts, and that those too must be feeling the same relief. However, I couldn't find them among the crowd, and I alone stood aloof. Don't get me wrong. At this time I wasn't actually happy that he was gone, nor had I thought, had the choice been in my hands, that I would have taken his life. However, I was unmistakably relieved that someone else had chosen to do so. The next day at school, it seemed as if things had gotten back to normal. As I sat in math class, I couldn't stop staring at the empty seat across from me as I ran the infinite possibilities surrounding the demise of Richard Peck through my mind. Though I don't remember this being the case, there must have been a most untoward expression on my face, for Miss Crawford stopped what she was doing and stood staring me down before uttering, What are you smiling at? Why are you staring at Richard's seat? I looked up at her with what must have been the look of a deer in the headlights. I wasn't, I tried, but this was in vain. What do you mean? You're still smirking. What are you playing at? Is there something funny you'd like to share with the class? The words of Mr. Eden from the previous week echoed through my mind. I couldn't imagine how or if my mother would react were I to be actually expelled from school. She was too unpredictable. I forced myself to make a serious face now. I don't think anything is funny. She scowled at me in the worst kind of way, causing my arousal levels to reach a peak as she scolded. Richard was a good kid, a nice boy. His parents are good people, well respected in our town. You, on the other hand, are recalcitrant and mean. You have an ugly soul. Someone from across the room shouted. It matches his face. Miss Crawford didn't bother to divert her eyes towards the culprit, but merely held them on me, as if in that moment she wished to kill me. At this point, the sexual tension within my being had risen to a new peak. I lost all control. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like Richard Peck was a good person. He was an asshole. He tortured me for years. He deserved what he got. She lost all control now. In response, she shrieked. Oh, that is it, you evil little freak. Get the hell out of my classroom. As I ran down the aisle and towards the door, she cocked her arm back with the blackboard eraser in it. I flinched, covering my face as I ran without stopping, to the amusement of the class who erupted with a sea of uncontrolled laughter. I didn't stop at the office, or even at my locker, but just kept going, out of the school, down the road, and heading towards home. When I got home, I ran past the straw man with tears streaming down my face went inside the house, and ran straight up the stairs to my bedroom. I heard my mother come in some time later, but I didn't come out to see her. I knew there would be questions as to why I was home, and instead I just lay as quietly as I could in my bed under the sheets. Later that night, I heard my mother's cell phone ringing. A little while after the noise had ceased, 
I heard thunderous footsteps heading towards my bedroom. As the door flew open, I feared it would come off the hinges. There stood my mother in the door, naked as the day she was born. By the expression on her face, I could tell she was enraged, and I sat up in the bed to face her. Mom, I queried innocently. Rather than replying, she shrieked at the top of her lungs as she charged at me from across the room. She was fast, and I couldn't react quickly enough as she punched me with closed fists twice in the head. After the second one caught me, I managed to cover my face and turn my head into the corner. She continued to pummel me with less effective blows in my back and shoulders. Her ring had caught me in the eyebrow, and I could feel it bleeding into my pillow. When she finally stopped, I turned and cried out through a veil of choking tears. You cut me, Mama. You cut me. I could feel it bleeding freely and the blood was smeared across the side of my face, covering the birthmark. You're lucky that's all you got, you little shit. I watched as she reached down and pulled the string that hung between her legs, removing the bloody menstrual product from her cavity and whipping it straight into my face. There, soak it up, you little girl. The school just left a voicemail. I know you've been expelled. You're going to have to earn now, just like your mother. You're going to turn tricks. That means grown men, boy. You better pucker up. With that, she turned and in a rage slammed the door as she left. I turned and cried into my pillow until the night had fallen and no more tears would come. I was terrified of what the future held for me, and all I could see was infinite darkness. In the middle of the night, I heard a noise as of someone ascending the stairs and then moving down the hallway past my room towards the master bedroom. I heard the door to my mother's bedroom open softly and then close again. I thought she had already gone to bed and so I rose to investigate. I crept down the hall sufficiently cautiously that I wouldn't be heard and soundlessly turned the doorknob cracking open the door. Inside I saw mother sitting on her bed with her back towards me by the light of the moon. She was moaning and bouncing up and down rhythmically. Contrary to all my natural inclinations, rather than running I entered the room a few paces to better understand what my eyes were observing. That's when I saw the person underneath her. It was the straw man. His demonic eyes flickered right at me as I screamed. Next thing I knew it was no longer the straw man but myself that lay in the bed beneath her. Just as quickly, rather than my mother, it was Miss Crawford who straddled me in my mother's bed. I felt the most intense pleasure I had ever felt in my life even as she continued to shame and badmouth my appearance. I awoke soaking wet, my groin in pain. I thought I might have had a wet dream, but as I pulled the blankets down, I realized that the bed was also soaked with either sweat or urine. I knew there would be no clean sheets, and as I felt around, I realized that it was soaked down to the mattress. I changed into a dry pair of underwear and resolved to sleep on the floor with my old sleeping bag. I continued rubbing my groin which had grown sensitive with the friction of my nocturnal masturbation. I eventually managed to drift off to sleep on the hard floor in exhaustion. When I awoke, I rose with a fierce hunger and began walking down the stairs to get some cereal. I heard the television blaring as I went, but didn't bother to look into the living room, instead marching straight down the hall towards the kitchen. As I stood pouring some milk on the cornflakes, my mother suddenly appeared in the door in her birthday suit and ran towards me. I flinched, expecting the worst. But rather than assault me, she threw her arms around me in a bear hug. Oh, my son, I just heard the most awful thing on the news. She forced my face towards her and began examining the cut above my eye, which was still tender. I'm so sorry, son. 
I'm just glad you're okay. I'm glad you are out of that awful school. I struggled to push her away and get a grip on my thoughts. What do you mean? What did you hear? She looked at me with wide, tearful eyes. The school. It burnt down. I knew that old school was a death trap. They don't use the tax money for nothing to repair the school. Just keep it to pay themselves. They said one of those teachers died in the fire. What teacher? I don't know, some lady. Crawford is the name. I dropped the spoon into the cereal bowl, causing it to splash out onto the counter. My mother looked at me in astonishment. Don't tell me that was your teacher. That was your teacher? I simply nodded in affirmation before she fell onto me again blubbering and kissing the side of my face. I'm so sorry, my son. I'm so sorry. We'll figure this out together. We'll get you into a new school. Move if we have to. I'll do anything for you. Just forgive your mother. We stood there for a while, my face smashed into her bosom as she wept into my shirt. The next day, after my mom had shot up and passed out on the couch, I took her phone and began searching the internet. The details regarding the school were slim but through a variety of sources, I managed to put together that it wasn't an accident and that the police had found evidence of arson. In addition, Miss Crawford had not been the only one to die in the blaze. There was also a janitor who had been found dead. The most puzzling piece of this was that while the janitor had perished due to the effects of the fire, Miss Crawford had been dead before smoke inhalation could occur. Therefore, it was believed that she had been murdered and that the crime was possibly sexually motivated. It was unclear whether at this time the janitor was the primary suspect, and if so, how he had failed to escape the inferno that he himself had set. It wasn't clear whether the CCTV footage had survived and the police were currently offering no details in this regard. In the days that followed, I sat mostly by myself, in a paralyzed cloud of gloom. My mother had continued seeing clients and shooting up, and had mostly forgotten about her resolution to help me with getting into a new school. Therefore, as usual, I knew I'd be on my own. I wished to God that my father hadn't left, that he was still by my side to guide me. But this could never be so. I thought about asking my mother if she had any contact information for him, something to help me track him down. Before I could do so, the most unexpected visitor of all derailed this ambition. It was the afternoon of Halloween when I heard the pounding on the door. My first instinct was to ignore it, but when it persisted for two more bouts of thunderous knocking, I understood that the visitor wasn't going to give up so easily. As I went down the stairs, I saw a man wearing a long trench coat, a button-up shirt, and a tie. I understood immediately that he was a detective with the police. I briefly considered running back up the stairs to attempt to wake my mother, but the idea she had ingrained in me of the state taking me away to some facility if they found out how we lived held sway over me. And so I continued down the stairs to unlock and open the door. I stared at the detective who'd been strangely examining the straw man and had turned around in surprise when he heard the door open behind him. Hey there, young man. Is your mom home? Who are you? I asked, playing stupid. I'm a cop he said, pulling out his badge and flashing it to me. And I need to have a word with your mother. Is she home? Or are you here all by yourself, son? My mind raced to find the proper response. She got called into work. It was an emergency. She only just left. The babysitter is on the way over. I was supposed to stay in with the door locked. I wasn't supposed to answer but you kept knocking. 
He eyed me suspiciously. I could tell by his look he was a seasoned vet. That's okay, son. It was actually you that I wanted to speak with anyways. But technically your mom is supposed to be here when I do. Could you do me a favor, kid? Save me some gas money. Let me know when I could expect her to be back. I looked at him tight-lipped and didn't answer him directly. Well, he said, placing his hand on the wall and leaning over me so that he could see more of the interior of the house. I leaned forward a bit myself, forcing him to back up. What did you say your name was? He smiled, a knowing smile, and winked at me. I didn't. It's Detective Palkman. You want my badge number too, kid? I smiled a fleeting smile before the fear again gripped me. Look, he said, reading me like a book. You seem like a street smart kid. You probably know what this is about. Just between me and you, maybe you can answer some questions, and we don't have to involve your mother in any of this. I slowly nodded my head in agreement, not knowing what else to do. I watched as he grabbed the edge of the door and opened it further, causing my hand to fall off the knob. Why don't you show me in so we can talk in private? He didn't wait for a response, but simply counted on me stepping out of the way as he entered, which I meekly did. I waved my hand, signaling him into the living room, but he took a good look around. He took his time, his eyes wandering from the hallway that led down to the kitchen and up to the stairs before he entered into the living room which was on his right, past the stairs. He sat down on the couch, facing the TV, and I sat in a sitting chair on the opposite side from him. He settled back deeply into the couch and stretched his legs out, groaning as if his joints had been tightly wound up to that point. Before long, he began the interrogation. So, you probably heard about your school, huh? I imagine you know that's why I'm here. I slowly nodded my head. Now, that Miss Crawford, she was your math teacher, right? Again, I nodded wordlessly, and he quickly began jotting something down in a notepad before surveying me again. Now, I heard you were expelled a few days ago. From the sounds of what I was told, you had quite a vendetta against that math teacher of yours. Like you weren't too into numbers or something. He smiled wryly as he asked. No, I said firmly. I had nothing to do with her. She just got me in trouble over another kid that passed away. His smile widened now. Yeah, that's right. I heard something about you and this other boy, Richard Peck. You two didn't really see eye to eye on much, now did you? I gulped now and looked down at the floor. I was desperately searching for a way out, but there seemed to be none. How about it? You're not going to clam up on me now, are you? I slowly nodded my head, denying his accusation, and at length I answered him. He was a bully. He bullied lots of kids. I was just one of them. Nothing important. He let out a loud sigh and placed his hands behind his head casually. Son, why don't you let me decide what's important to the case or not? And just answer my questions. It's really quite simple. If you didn't do anything, that is. Shall we continue? Yes, I whispered. He looks so arrogant now as if he had the whole thing figured out. With his shit-eating grin... Now, I talked with the principal, Mr. Eden, about your expulsion case, and his story differs quite a bit from yours. He says you had some kind of a, a fixation, is what he called it, on Miss Crawford. What do you say to that? It's not true, is all I could muster. Just then, there was a sudden fluster of footsteps coming from upstairs. The detective cocked his head to listen while giving me a quizzical glare. 
Now, I thought you said you were home alone, boy. I didn't respond to this as I watched him stand and cross the living room towards the stairs. As he did so, he turned to me. There's something weird going on here. You know that straw man out there's mask is singed to hell? He smells of smoke. We saw something strange on the cameras over at that school. He reached to unholster the gun that rode the side of his hip, and as he pulled it out, he placed his index finger to his lips. Just stay quiet. Stay right here. Everything else will be okay. I leaned over in my chair to watch him slowly disappear up the staircase with measured steps. I sat tense and waiting, not knowing what to expect, not understanding what was about to occur. As he neared the top, I heard the footsteps stop suddenly. There was a tremendous roar from the detective's mouth, followed by a woman's scream in a dense, thundering thud. Moments later, I heard a terrible pounding sound on the staircase, as of someone falling down, and before my eyes I saw the detective land in a bloody pile at the bottom of the stairs. As I looked at him, I could see that his forehead had been dented in, leaving a crater above his right eye. Blood poured from his right eye, from his mouth, his nose, his ear. His right leg was twisted to the side at a 90 degree angle at the knee. He was clearly dead. I slowly made my way towards the body in what must have been a hypnotic state. I couldn't take my eyes off his strange, distorted features. When I reached him, I knelt down and placed my two fingers on his neck, as I had seen people do in the movies before. I didn't feel a pulse. I timorously gazed up at the top of the stairs where I saw my mother standing completely naked with my old baseball bat in her hand. Her face was covered with blood spatter. Till now, she had been staring at the detective with a far off distant gaze, but as she saw me staring up at her, the spell broke and she spoke. I had to, I had to do it. They would have taken you away, locked you up. What in God's name are you talking about? I screamed up the stairs at her. We can't get away with this. They'll lock you away. The state will take me just like you said. She began to slowly descend the stairs as she spoke. You don't understand, Sonny. They would figure you out eventually. The school fire. The kid that was killed. Everything. I glared at her as she reached the middle of the staircase, the bat still in her hands. I didn't do anything, I whispered. She threw her head back and chuckled. What? You're innocent? One day you'll see that every murderer says so. Look at me. I'm innocent too now. I stood my ground forcefully. No, I didn't do anything. You, you killed this man. You're a murderer. I killed him to protect you, she growled at me as she reached the bottom of the stairs and stood towering over me. Drop that bat, I hollered at her. Drop it. I don't trust you. You probably killed my father, too. Now she really lost it. She not only laughed, but nearly fell over from doing so as the bat fell from her hand and clattered onto the floor. She had now gone completely hysterical and I feared that she might have lost her wits completely. As she finally calmed down a little, she was able to speak between bouts of compulsive chuckling. You really think that I, that I killed him? Oh Lord, you're further gone than I thought. I stood up in a rage. What are you talking about? Speak clearly for once. She smiled derisively as she said, it was you. You killed him. You saw the blood on his clothes, didn't you? On that straw thing out there? That was from you. I felt sick as the words sank into my being. I remember throwing up on the floor before being transported into a far away, distant place. It was six years ago. I was six years old. I woke up in the middle of the night, clutching my teddy bear. I heard a strange noise emanating from the hallway. I grabbed my baseball bat from the closet, 
and with Teddy in hand, headed out into the hallway. I quickly realized that the noise I heard was coming from my parents' bedroom. As I opened the door, I saw a man straddling my mother, his hands around her neck. In that moment, I saw red. Before I knew what was happening, I had crossed the room. I had raised the bat, and I had brought it down on the back of the man's head over and over and over and over. I remember watching as blood shot from the top of his head like a fountain as he collapsed backward onto the floor. I saw the face of my father twitching in its death throes. All I heard after that was my mother's shrieks. You ugly little freak. I asked him to do it. It's kink shit, you little bastard. What the hell did you do? As I came to, back to reality, I saw that my mother was standing in front of me with the bat in her hand again. I had to get rid of the body to save you. And now here I am again. I can't keep doing this. I need to put an end to it for good. I need to destroy the evil that I brought into the world. In God's name, she raised the bat high above her head. I sat on my knees staring up at the club expecting any moment to be obliterated. But that didn't happen. I watched as she was suddenly lifted off of her feet. I saw the worn work gloves wrapped around her neck. The bat instantly clattered to the floor as I saw her feet begin to twitch and jerk wildly. A moment later she was sailing through the air, landing hard on top of the dead man on the floor. In the landing, her ankle had snapped and the bone had punctured the skin, sticking out into the air. She howled in pain as she tried to begin crawling up the stairs. The straw man walked towards her, never averting his eyes. She had only made it to the fourth stair as he stood over her. He undid the front of his pants and collapsed onto her, beginning to have his way with her, all the while choking her with one hand. She screamed out to the extent that she could in terror and agony as she did. When he was finished, his hand moved to his belt and removed a large kitchen knife from his waist. He raised the knife in the air and brought it down squarely between her two breasts, where it plunged in all the way to the hilt. I imagined that this alone had killed her, as the life seemed to leave her eyes. But this didn't stop him. He continued to remove the knife and sink it in into her flesh over and over across her torso until a literal river of blood ran down the steps and pooled between the feet of the former detective. As he finally dropped the knife and stood drenched in blood, the world slowly faded away from me until nothingness and utter silence prevailed. The next day, the police apprehended me at the house. The straw man was nowhere to be seen, but I was found lying next to the dead bodies of Detective Palkman and my mother. The police concluded that I had killed Detective Palkman in an effort to cover up my previous crimes, and the murder of my mother was sexually motivated. After the media circus surrounding my tale of the straw man, the true culprit, I was sentenced to life in an institution for the criminally insane. Here I've sat for the past ten years waiting in silence. I haven't talked to a single therapist since I got here, and every attempt at rehabilitation has fallen on my deaf ears. The good thing is that there's a guy in the cell next to me who has a technique for making his own moonshine under the bed. Through sharing a glass of this with the orderly who works the graveyard shift, I've been able to earn some trust. I've learned he has an endless propensity for wanting to get shit-faced on free booze and shirk his responsibilities. This combined with the fact that I've managed to stock up a handful of sedatives in my mattress over the years has led to the culmination of this night. I can hear him now, zonked out on the hallway floor snoring. The last time he came in to check on me, 
I made sure to slip a piece of paper in the door as it shut so it wouldn't fully latch. I will leave this place tonight. And when I do, you will come to know my name and to fear it. I am the straw man. For those who prey on the weak and use their power and strength to bad ends. For those who carry malice in their hearts, who see themselves above the common man, who seek to control and enact injustices onto the masses. The straw man cometh. The straw man cometh into you. The straw man cometh for you.